I'm ready to get into the Bible study. So let's get started. Amen? I enjoy hanging out with you guys. Let's pray. God, we come before you. And as we prayed and worshiped and sang, you are worthy of every song we could ever sing. And even in our heart of hearts, where some in here are not believing those words and having a hard time seeing those words, I pray tonight as we're diving into the text that we can come back to that place where we can mean it with sincerity, that you, you're worthy of every song we could ever sing. I thank you for this church and these people and the saints that have gathered tonight, that this would be such a refreshment, that the word would saturate our ears and hearts and you would be glorified. We love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. We're studying Genesis chapter 14 tonight. It's going to be an incredibly short introduction. And the reason for that is because there's quite a bit of content to cover. But in the 14th chapter of Genesis, we're going to see the inception, the starting point, the beginning of the first, if you will, war. Civil war, if you want to call it that, local, regional war, we're going to see an incredibly large conflict take place between a coalition of kings who are going to gather together to wage war against another group of kings. So we're going to go straight into the text. I'm excited for the 14th chapter because there's a lot of fun words that I'm going to mispronounce. Again, giggle, if you will. It's quite all right. My feelings won't be hurt. Let's begin. Genesis chapter 14, verse 1. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, and this is the fun one, Ketaleomer, I just need you guys to know, I heard three different pastors see how they pronounce this word, and I liked that one the most. I won't tell you who says Ketaleomer, skip Heidsick, king of Elam, and the title king of nations. So right off the bat, as we're getting into the 14th chapter of Genesis, we're gonna see the heavyweight kings come out first and foremost from the east. And now we're going to see the kings declare war against the kings of the plains in verse two. Look what it says. It says that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shem Eber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. Again, I know for some of you, as I'm going through this, you're like, oh God, another one of those nights where I have to like listen to Jonathan painfully try to go through these words. I know it's going to be easy to try to tune me out, but again, I promise all of these are uh, important to the text. Again, you go through passages of Scripture in the New Testament that says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's true. Same with these words that are hard to diff, you know, pronounce and so forth. So even though it's going to be distracting, you know, stay with me because there's a lot that we're going to cover. Uh, but right off the bat, verse 2 tells us, a list of kings whose names, again, I refuse to repeat willingly. Uh, these guys who have settled in the plains are seeing a conflict with those who have settled in the east. Uh, th those who have settled in the plains, it's grassy, it's beautiful, it's lush, it's, it's surrounded by the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then you have the heavyweight kings in verse 1. They're declaring war against five kings that I just listed in verse two. And we're gonna see this conflict take place, but the heavyweight Eastern kings, they're gonna win the battle. Look at verse three. So all those, all these, excuse me, joined together in the valley of Sedim, that is the Salt Sea. Most of you might know another name for the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea. And I'm excited about this portion, and I'm going to stop there for a second. We had the wonderful privilege as a church to visit Israel in March, and we actually were able to visit the Dead Sea. And if, you've, and if you don't know this, the Dead Sea, you're literally, your bodies are literally able to float in it. And the reason for that is because the Dead Sea, get this guys, is made up of 33% salt content. Uh, to give you a better perspective, the Atlantic Ocean is comprised of about 
3% salt content. So if you've ever been to the Atlantic Ocean and it kind of gets in your mouth and your you know, thing goes on, imagine 33% of dead sea water, go, a drop, a drop gets on your tongue, it feels like acid going through your soul. I mean, it's, it's powerful. And you know what, because I can, I'm not even gonna describe it anymore. I'm gonna show you a picture. This first one, of course, is with my lovely wife and I. She doesn't even know I was gonna show this to you. We're floating in the Dead Sea. Isn't that fun and exciting? And as exciting as this picture is, you know what makes it more exciting? Adam West Batman on my chest in the Dead Sea. Look at this next picture. There he is. I need you guys to know something, that any time we go through the text that anywhere geographically I've been to in Israel, we're gonna show it on our Wednesday night study. Nine out of 10 times, Adam West Batman is going to be in the pictures. Also, if you look in the photobomb background, that's Shay, Shay Hoodman's wife, Melissa. She's uh, the co-president of gotquestions.org. It's irrelevant again to the text, but I just thought you should know because you're looking at the picture and that's what you do at family gatherings. It's like, watch this three hour photo session I'm gonna show you of my trip to a place you don't care about. Anyways, anyways, moving on. We're digressing. The Dead Sea though, guys, was fantastic. It was great. Uh, the Dead Sea, back into our text in Genesis chapter 14. That's where this battle is taking place in the 14th chapter, near this vicinity uh, where the kings of the east are gonna you know, battle against the kings of the plains. And by the way, geographically, if you wanna just get a, like a mental picture, we're not gonna have a map up there, but the, uh, the Dead Sea is in southern Israel. So if you imagine geographically, the Sea of Galilee is north of it, go about 60 miles south, you're gonna find yourself in the Dead Sea. But here in Genesis chapter 14, this battle that takes place between these groups, between these uh, regions that are represented is near the Dead Sea itself, this heavyweight battle. And then we're told in the fourth verse of Genesis chapter 14, look what it says. 12 years they, of course referring to the kings in verse two that lost, 12 years they served Ketaleomer, and in the 13th year, they rebelled. Stop there for a second. Interestingly enough, numbers are important throughout scripture. There's things that are symbolic, pertaining to numbers, things that are uh, consistent with one another. If you see certain numbers throughout the Bible, they represent something. They're a symbol and a type of, and a picture of something. And this is interesting and fascinating because this is the first mention of 12 in scripture. And 12, the number is, it's a representation of government. Uh, while it's interesting, the number 13 becomes a type in a picture of rebellion, anarchy, and so forth, which is why in verse four it says it was the 13th year that they're going to rebel. The reason why all this is even important, why I'm even sharing it, is because we're gonna see Lot, who is the nephew of Abram. Remember last week we learned about Abram and Lot, that there was conflict between the herdsmen and, and Abram in his graciousness said, choose the right or the left. They're looking at this giant land that God promised and gave specifically to Abram. And in his gracious, loving, fantastic, generous heart says to his nephew, pick the left and I'll go to the right. Pick to the right and I'll go to the left. And we found out that Lot makes his way to Sodom and Gomorrah, that region in that area. So Lot's nephew, Abram, is gonna find himself in the middle of this strife. And we're gonna find out at the end of this chapter that Abram's gonna have to bail out his nephew. But the point is this, hey, Lot was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Moving on, verse five of Genesis 14, uh, it says in the 14th year, Ketaleomer and the kings that were with him came and attacked Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Kernaim, the Zuzim in Ham, Emim in Shava, Kariathim. Love it. Verse 6. And the Horites in the mountains of Sur, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Verse 7. Then they turned back and came to En Mishfet that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites, also the Amorites who dwell in Hazazon, Tamar. So they're giving specific 
detailed information as to the people involved in the battle, as to those who were attacking whom. And the one thing that actually stands out, and maybe it hasn't stand, stood out to you as I was reading it, is that we're told they attacked the country of the Amalekites. Now, interestingly enough, if you've gone through the book of 1 Samuel or the book of 2 Samuel, specifically, though, in the book of 1 Samuel in the 15th chapter, uh, it won't be on the screen yet, we, we see this conflict take place. We see this perversion with a group of people, the, the Amalekites. And I'm actually going to, you know, because it's a Bible study and this is what we do. In the 15th chapter, we're told God instructing um, Samuel at the time, the prophet, to tell Saul, who is the king of Israel, as to what to do pertaining to this problematic, perverse culture, the Amalekites. I'm just going to read to you a couple things. We're told that Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord, this is now, the Lord has sent me. I'm get, I have a message for you, Saul, to anoint you as king over the people over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. And at that point, Saul's got to listen. You're right. God spoke to you. Whatever comes next, this is important. Verse 3 of the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, he instructs him, go attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them. And if you know this story, what does Saul do? He doesn't, he doesn't do exactly what he was instructed. He does spare them. And it's a sad picture of what happens. In fact, this portion will be on the screen. Look at this, 1 Samuel 15, 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. It's sad because at that point when Samuel realized what he did, you begin to see Saul justifying why he didn't listen to God. And he gives almost like this godly answer. Well, we took the fatlings of the lamb and other animals in order to sacrifice to the Lord. And then you know the, the, what Saul will, or Samuel will say to Saul, no, it's better to obey than it is to sacrifice. And, and it becomes this sad picture. And by the way, last time I taught this Bible study years ago, someone came up to me and was trying to understand that concept. How could a loving God do such a thing in terms of declare to destroy a group of people. First thing we need to understand pertaining to God, and this is what the Bible says, get this. Did you know that the Bible says that God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked? Did you know that? God doesn't delight and take great pleasure in watching people die because the Bible also says that he desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But they became such, the Amalekites, a perverse group, unruly, willing to do anything for the glorification of evil. And you know, you guys need to understand, we serve a just God, a holy God that demands sin to be dealt with. What God had instructed Saul to do and he didn't listen becomes again a type and a picture. And it's the same for us that when we listen to God and we partially obey that we know that partial obedience is, is disobedience. But even in Genesis chapter 15, this conflict of people that are going to eventually, years and years later, make their way into the, the first and second chapter of Samuel, still problematic. And then we get back to Genesis chapter 14. In the eighth verse, we find, and you can see it on the screen, the king of Sodom, this king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out, they joined together in the valley of the valley of Sadim. Verse 9. I love this one. Against Kidale Omer, king of Elam, title king of nations, Armraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elesis, Elesar, excuse me. Four kings against five. That was, that was good. Let's keep going. Verse 10. The valley of Sedim was full of asphalt pits. I told you guys weeks ago, another translation of asphalt pits in the King James translation is slime pits. Continuing verse 10. The king of Sodom and Gomorrah, they fled and some 
fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Now, the slime pits, again, in the asphalts, or the asphalt, excuse me, was an area that was, it was tar-like. It was this tar-like substance. We also learned during our Genesis study, during the construction of the ark, that this same substance was used as a way to waterproof the ark. But anyways, uh, this is the place that we're going to see again in scripture, and you're going to know it, where God is going to eventually send some type of fire from heaven. It's going to consume Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, which were only a couple of weeks away. And most likely these slime pits, these tar-like substances, probably burned for an incredibly long period of time. Another fascinating thing to point out is that the Tower of Babel, again, was also used for pitch and mortar. And that word pitch, it's a word that signifies tar or oil. Do you guys know the, the oil tycoon? as in John Rockefeller, an incredibly wealthy man. Uh, he was a, like an oil tycoon that started in the 1800s. He's eventually going to die by 1937. But he co-founded a company called Standard Oil Company. Now get this. This is speculation. But Rockefeller had read portions of scripture, specifically, I was told, in Genesis chapter 14. And he figured, well, there's got to be tar. Uh, in certain areas, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, and he began to explore to find a lot of this stuff. And that's where uh, much of his wealth actually came from, from going to these places in the Middle East and finding it, uh, extracting it. And that, let, let me help you to understand the, the value of his wealth, the volume of his wealth. By the time he will die in 1937, his assets are going to equal, get this, 1.5 of America's total economic output, meaning his net worth today, if it was equivalent to today, would be about $340 billion, which is almost four times the amount of what Bill Gates is worth. And we just found out that the fun company Amazon has exceeded and has become this ginormous company. Uh, but just even, even for 1937 at that time, it was a vast amount of numbers. And, and wealth. But again, he, and again, this was just a speculative thing that, hey, Genesis 14 is what's, you know, prompted that, whether it's true or not. I thought it was interesting. So anyways, back to the text. After 13 years of the kings of the plains revolting against the kings of the east, we find out that the kings, or the heavyweight uh, kings, they flee uh, to the slime pits or where the asphalts were. And at the end of verse 10, we were told that the, that the remainder fled specifically to the mountains. Now, again, if you've been to Israel today, we actually were able to visit a lot of these areas. <laughs> yes, we're about to visit another geographical site in our adventure of Genesis chapter 14. But if you went to the Dead Sea with us, or if you've been to Israel at any portion, you're going to notice that there's these surrounding regions of mountains. And one of the mountains that's near there, that's at, at least notable, is Masada. Masada, a group of us some of them took a little lift up to the very top, but those who are strong in spirit walked up the mountain. And I want to show you a picture of us walking up Masada. Now, this was great because for some of you that are unable to see, the, the, you see the little people, it's like this little zigzag that makes its way up and they're like little ants on the way to, on, all the way to the top. It took us about, I don't know, like 35 minutes to walk this thing. Uh, it, it was an amazing hike. Now, let me give you a different angle of what took place. This is a picture of the top of Masada overseeing the Dead Sea. So now we've made our way to the top of Masada. And if you look, it's so faint. But that blurriness in the background, that is the Dead Sea. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this at some point is the Rocky Mountainy region. So that the kings are going to eventually flee. And where did they go? We don't, I, you know, we're not really for certain as to where they fled pertaining to these mountains. But as always, it's important for us to see where would Adam West flee if he was on Masada. Look at this picture. There he is. Adam West on top of Masada in Israel overseeing. Actually, his back is to the Dead Sea. You see that top left corner? That is the Dead Sea as well. Again, how does this at all relate to our Bible study? It doesn't. But again, I have 148 photos of Adam West in Israel, and I'm looking forward to many more that you will see in the weeks to come. But anyway, so you can, you can take it off now. <laughs> 
The mountains is where the kings are going to flee. We don't know where, but at least you can get a picture, an idea of where they could have gone, and it's a ginormous geographical location. Continuing in our study, verse 11 of Genesis 14, they, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their provisions, they went their way. They also took Lot. Again, because Lot was in the wrong place at the wrong time. They took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and they departed. Again, remember it from last week in Genesis, in our study, we learned that there was a strife between Abram and Lot's herdsmen, which again, when I was reading that last week, I didn't stop myself, but in the middle of reading it, it said strife between the herdsmen. I was like, that's a perfect band name right there. Again, irrelevant to our Bible study. But that's exactly what happened is that the herdsmen, they're all, you know, the parts of, because they, they acquired so much pl- um, uh, wealth from uh, Egypt and ed- other areas where they had gone. And the herdsmen are, you know, Abram's herdsmen are having a problem with, with Lot's herdsmen and they're grazing on the same land. And, and Abram's like, you know what, let's just avoid this strife. You choose the right or the left and, and I'll go to the opposite end of whatever you choose. And so of course, Lot makes his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. The battle takes place. The plunders of war are in effect right here. And they know and they see or find out somehow that Lot had a, acquired a lot, and so they took all of it. They took everything. And again, normal spoils of war, and not only that, but then Lot was taken along as captive till verse 13. Look what it says in the text. Genesis 14, 13, then the one who had escaped came and told, one person tells, Abram the Hebrew. Stop there for one second. We'll get back to the the remaining of this verse. The wording there, it's the first use of the word Hebrew in the Bible. And the word Hebrew comes from a root word that means passed over. The Septuagint translates it as the passenger. For those that don't know what the Septuagint is, it's basically a translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. But back into verse 13. So there's one person who escapes. They came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkul, and brother of Anur, and there were allies with Abram. A lot of you understand pertaining to family, that it's true, there's strength in, in the bondage of family. Some of you in here would do whatever for your friends. You love your friends. The Bible says a friend loves at all times, and that is true. But when it comes to family, for some of you, you'd catch a grenade for them. You'd throw your hand on a blade for them. You would jump in front of a train for them. Yes, thank you to those inspirational lyrics by Mr. Bruno Mars. But you get my point is that for family, you're going to do whatever it takes to look out for one another. And Abram was such a man where he found out that his nephew Lot, even though he was commanded not to bring him by God, is in trouble. And he needs to do something to get him out of this pickle. And he goes, Abram goes beyond risking his own life to save Lot. Look at verse 14 of Genesis 14. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house. And they went in pursuit as far as Dan. I want you, I want you to notice that it's specifically, it's not just 318 servants. They're not ordinary servants. It says they're trained servants who were born within the household. And I want you to, within Abram's household, I, I want you to just understand the odds that are taking place right here. In Abram's ambitious, like, we're gonna do this and I'm gonna bring all the servants with me. He only had 318 against the entire Eastern portion of four kings represented. It would be like me, John Geraci, trying to attack the cast of the Expendables. I mean, it would just be the saddest thing. I'd be like, guys, I gotta let you know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna attack the whole cast. <laughs> like, this is, it's, it's sad. You would laugh. You laugh because, because it's, it's just ridiculous. And such odds, such as what we're reading here in the 14th chapter, it's insane. In fact, the similarity of what we might see in other portions of scripture is with Gideon where 300 men are going to go against 135,000 Midianites. 
But that's why I can say with such confidence, and I can say it smiling, that when God is for us, who can be against us? Because remember the promise of the 12th chapter that we read a couple weeks ago. Guys, Abram had fellowship with God. And then not only does God just make himself known to comfort him that I am God and your creator, God makes a promise to him that I'm going to bless those who bless you. Abram, I'm going to make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing. And not only that, I'm going to curse those who curse you. Numbers, numbers are irrelevant if God is before us. Guys, numbers are irrelevant if God is before us. And it was the same for Gideon. It was the same for Abram here in the 14th chapter of Genesis. Guys, listen, it's the same for you. Guys, it's the same for you. It's so true. And, and, and it's not only the same for you, it's the same in every circumstance. We're going to talk some more about it here in a second, but for the sake of time, let's move on. So look what, look what Abram's strategy is in the 15th verse. Gets his 318 trained born identity, vigilante, militia trained soldiers, guys, born in his household. Look what he does. Verse 15. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Again, Abram, without any military wisdom, has this moment of clarity, of instant perfect training as to what to do. And it's like, is this going to work, though? Again, this seems like something I would come up with. Like, maybe this will work. It would be like me coming to the staff and be like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the city of Denver and clean it all up in, a, in, in an hour. It's like, well, John, I think the power has gotten to your head. And this isn't a, no, we're going to do it. I would be the only one who is up there. But honestly, this is crazy. This is literally crazy what we're reading right here. Is this going to work? even with attacking in the middle of the night. Verse 16, look what it says. So he brought back all the goods, and he also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. Success. So not only does, does he win the ambush, he manages to get both Lot and even the goods of Lot that he acquired, which we learned in the previous chapter was a lot. It was he acquired a ton. Everything that was stolen, they retrieved. 318 men in Abram, and they accomplish it. A small army against the armies. Guys, listen, of four kings representing four nations, and they win. And the odds, again, look insanely terrible. They are completely outnumbered. But God gave them the victory. I'm going to say it again. God gave them the victory. Why do you suppose we're so prone to forget the victory God gives us in our life? Guys, we forget often the victories God gives us. And those should be the things that fuel us when other obstacles come our way. That God gave me the victory from this past engagement of whatever it might be. And you know why God wants us to give us the victory? So that we can place our hope and trust in Him. But it does. It requires diligence, trust in his word. It requires steps of faith. Guys, even when the odds are against us, if anything, when the odds are against us, it's the Lord showing us even more. Like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go before you still. It's going to force you to realize, even with the odds against you, that I am a God who is above all. Guys, and it's true for your marriage. It's true for your relationships, your finances, whatever your living situation might be. I need you to understand what defines as success or successful victories. And it's different for each one of you, but in my opinion, I think God wants us to spot them, to grab them and hone on to them. Because we become so often pessimistic people and we become bitter and we become just this, these, like, well, you know, I'm, and we become cynical. And maybe it's because I drink a lot of coffee. I don't know. But guys, I just, I have no reason to. Even, and I told you guys last week, even with the attacks my family has been facing, I feel like for months, God gets the victory. I'm in no position to complain. My girls eat every single day. Even when the cupboards are bearish, <laughs> they eat. We have a house. 
We've never had an issue with, with housing my girls. We've never had an issue where we, we, we've said to our church here at Calvary South Denver, we can't meet anymore, sorry. God takes care of his kids. He gives good gifts to us. And the point that I'm trying to make, and even though it might seem ins insignificant to you, to count the victories. Count the victories. Give God the, the, just give God the glory and the credit. Because ladies and gentlemen, he gave us a spirit of power and sound mind. He gave you a spirit of sound mind. He gave you the ability through his spirit, the imparting wisdom, listen, to rationalize the reading and understanding of his word. And that the Bible says, if you lack wisdom, he'll give it to you. He won't hold back. Did you know that? I read the Bible and I don't get it. Ask God for wisdom and ask to understand it. It's that easy? Yeah, the book of James actually talks about it. He will give it to you. He has given us the victory, plain and simply, because the cross screams victory and power. Why do you suppose Satan wants us to forget the promises of God so often? Because the battle is already won. The battle is won, and yet Satan, yeah, he's relentless to take everyone down that he can to, to avoid and to prevent us from going back to the promise of scripture that God has conquered death, that he has conquered the issue of, of sins, that you and I can come into a relationship with him because of the cross and more importantly, because of his resurrection. The victory is won. Back to Genesis 14. They're completely outnumbered, but God gave them the victory. An interesting and fascinating thing about Abram, as far as I've read uh, throughout Genesis, Abram's a peacemaker. He's not a troublemaker. He wants to make peace with Lot, even with the strife between his herdsmen. He wants to make peace with those all around him. And even when Abram comes to this place where he forms an alliance with the people of Canaan, he's a peacemaker. But here, he goes to war. The Bible says, if at all possible, live peaceably among one another which we're gonna break that down here in a second, but I have to tell you a story about my father, Gino Geraci. He told me growing up, under no circumstances can you fight in school. Don't do it, Jonathan. And it's Gino Geraci, don't do it. And he said, unless it pertains to bullies. My dad, your pastor, Gino Geraci said, if you ever see a bully at school, I'm quoting him now. Do whatever it takes to stop it. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I can't tolerate it. Well, it so happens I have one story where it does happen. It wasn't like this like excuse to be violent. There was a guy in middle school, I won't say his name, Morgan. Anyways, he, uh, <laughs> he started picking on a kid. And we're talking straight up over acting Hollywood glamorized bullying where you watch movies and it's like, that doesn't happen in real life. And it happened in the, in the 90s in middle school for me. <laughs> and we see it take place and, I, and we're like, leave him alone. And Mor this person, Morgan, says, whatever, shut up. And he starts putting this kid in the headlock and straight up being mean to this kid. And it's like, dude, you better stop. And he's like, or else what? Keep in mind, Morgan is like three times my size for an eighth grader, but still, he's a huge kid. Anyways, I was like, yeah, and thump. He didn't even move. It was seriously the most frightening thing in my life. It's like, dad, you failed me. The teachers came out, stopped the fight. Morgan started crying. It was just so terrorizing and just scary in that moment. Fast forward into the future, his parents file a restraining order against me and two other kids that were there. The cops are there, my dad is there, we're all sitting in a circle and we're trying to explain the situation. They drop the charges. Everything's done. We're walking out, it's the cold, quiet silence of walking back to the car with dad. And he looks at me and he says, son, I'm proud of you. I said, really? He's like, you did whatever it took to stop a fight against a boy that couldn't defend himself. And he's like, but next time, try to avoid punching him or at least do it right. All right. <laughs> it 
Abram, although this peacemaker, father of faith eventually, called Abraham here in a moment, was a peacemaker, he fought to bring the peace, which seems counterintuitive and it seems contradictory, but that's exactly what happens. And keep in mind, guys, I'm not saying that things happen where it's always going to result in actual physical fighting to stop something. And I'm going to say it again. Things don't always have to end in actual physical fighting. But for some of you, the easiest solution when it comes to conflict is to be a pacifist. And as noble and as wonderful as that might sound on paper, you know, fighting's wrong. I'll battle with love. That's, you know, that's great. That's great. I commend you for that uh, to, you know, violence... And, and things physically when it comes to war or whatever is unjustifiable in your book. Again, I commend you. Because again, the Bible says, if at all possible, live peaceably at, with, among one another. Does it always happen that way though? Which is interesting that Paul will use that wording, if at all possible. Not just live at peace with one another. Because Paul gets it, man. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about how even Abram himself, that he loved peace. Guys, he loved peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is the guy who understood the importance of it, but he was willing to fight for it. But this is where it gets strangely unusual in our study and book of Genesis, the 14th chapter. Look what verses 17 through 20 say. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Kedalomer. Gosh, I'm not liking that one. And the kings who were with him, verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salam, brought out bread and wine. Look at this next part. He was the priest of God most high. Stop there for a second. I know we're going to go to verse 20, but just we're told right here that Melchizedek was a king, but at the same time, he's a priest. I'll explain to you why that's important here in a moment. Verse 19, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram, the God of most high possessor of heaven and earth, verse 20, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So again, first question, who's Melchizedek? Interestingly enough, we don't know. We don't know fully as to who this guy is. We have no idea where he came from, how he even came to Canaan, how he even knew Abram, uh, or even more specifically, and this is what stands out to me, how he became a worshiper of God in a culture that was saturated in polytheism and the, the worship of multiple gods. And not only that, but we're told Melchizedek brought out bread and wine in verse 18, and he blessed Abram. I'll read it again. He said, blessed be Abram of the God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Melchizedek, his name, it comes from two words. It means king of righteousness. And not only that, we're told he's the king of Salem, which is eventually going to become Jerusalem. The word Salem means peace. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He brings out bread and wine. He worships God most high. Again, he's a monotheistic worshiper like Abram, meaning he worships the one and true only God as opposed to a polytheistic culture. But not only that, it says he pays tithes to him. Again, who is this guy? And the reason why this is problematic, especially as I was prepping and studying for this, Aside from the fact that you have a Canaanite king who's submerged in a polytheistic culture, he knows Abram. And how, how did he get to know and worship the one and true living God? Because up to this point, at least we would think Abram's the only mon monotheistic individual because God spoke to him. He's made promises to him pertaining to even an urn and, and, and the Chaldeans revealed himself to him. Could it be that God revealed himself to Melchizedek the same way as he did for Abram? It's possible. Uh, but the problem that at least is standing out to me is that he's a priest. Uh, the reason why that's a problem is that at least history has shown us, at least biblical history, at least church history has shown us that there's dangers to combine the religious and civic authority together in one. 
In fact, God is going to forbade uh, the kings of Israel to be priests and the priests to be kings. In 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, Chronicles chapter 26, King Uzziah, he's going to try to do the work of the priest and be a king, and God's going to strike him with leprosy. And yet here, Melchizedek is an exception. To complicate it even more, I'm going to read to you Psalm 110, verses 1 and 4. And this is actually going to be on the screen. It's a messianic psalm. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Look at this next part. I have made you a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Psalm 110 is going to give us this, at least it tells us the priesthood, the, the whole chapter itself itself tells us that the priesthood of the Messiah is the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek as opposed to the order of Aaron. Because then you go to Hebrews chapter 7 and Melchizedek, and this is, again, this is where it's so bizarre, this character. He's described as without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And just as I read from that psalm a second ago, we see this messianic psalm that I have made you a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, because of this passage, <laughs> this is where it gets so bizarre. Some people's speculation as to who they think this guy is. Uh, first, they think he's a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus. I don't think that's true. Uh, not only that, uh, some have suggested he's Seth, the son of Noah, or that he's Job, he's an angel. This is where it gets like straight up bonkers. I don't even remember the last time I've used that word in a sermon. But this is where it gets bonkers, guys. There are some people, I wish I was kidding when I say this, that they think he is an actual outer space visitor. You heard me correctly. They think that he's like this unfallen Adam type from another planet sent to observe the progress of God's work of redemption of a fallen race. People are literally concluding this. I'm just waiting for like Fox Mulder and Agent Scully to come into the back of the sanctuary and be like, we can either confirm nor deny the alien known as Melchizedek to be real. At some point, even when prepping for Bible studies, like I have to stop and I'm like, this is literally wasting my time because I've spent two hours researching this stuff that has nothing to do with our Bible study. And anyways, there, there's some straight up bizarre, zero biblical foundation to support a lot of these things. We really have no idea who he is. We have no idea. But what we do know is that he is not an appearance of Jesus himself. At, at the very least, he's a type in a picture of, of Jesus, but he is not Jesus. And honestly, when I read that portion of scripture between Melchizedek and Abram, this relationship they have to me, what actually stands out to me is that it says he gave him a tithe of all. Abram gave unto the Lord, and he did it through the giving to Melchizedek as a tithe to all. It's almost as if Abram and Melchizedek work together to see almost who can bless each other more. This type and picture of how, how, even how community works with one another. Melchizedek blesses Abram out of his resources. Abram blesses Melchizedek out of his resources. And again, I, I, at least what stands out to me, guys, is becomes this attitude that we should have when it comes to community. And rarely do I have these moments where I'm on a, on a soapbox, but I'm going to say it. I strongly support community that we as a church are gonna always read the Bible, we're always gonna study the scriptures, we're always gonna be a church that values God's word. But I need you to know, guys, the heartbeat of me is that we infuse worship, the word, community to this church. And the reason why is because God hardwired us to do this thing called life together. And I'm even okay with telling this story really quick. I'm gonna sit down telling this story. We had our community group a couple weeks ago. Excuse me, a group of our community group that we're in. We're just hanging out. And the four of us are talking about an, a way to bless someone on our staff because they don't have AC at their house. And I'm okay with saying this. It's James in the back, who he and I are wearing the same t-shirt tonight. And we're just asking one of the guys in our community group who works with HVAC, do you ever have, you know, James, or Sebastian, our facilities manager and pastor, uh, was asking, 
like, do you guys ever have a, a, a additional AC units that you just chuck and they're completely fine? And David began saying, well, yeah, all the time, actually. And then he began texting some people with his company that he works with. And he's like, actually, we might be able to do something where we can get him a, a used unit. And then he finally says, you know what? We're going to pay for everything. We're going to buy him a brand new AC, new furnace. We're going to take care of all of it. And it's going to be on our dime. And the reason why I'm telling you that story, A, from the very fact that the Reitmer family was able to be blessed now with a brand new furnace and AC unit in their house. I tell you that story because it all started with community. That we were able to see a group of people in our church bless one another. And the reason why I'm so adamant about community, what if we as a church believed in community to a point where we were submerged in one another's life, and for some of you that makes you really uncomfortable, to the point where we knew each other's needs we don't have to call the church every four seconds to ask, but we already know because we're involved in community and we can bless one another with the resources God has given us to bless the body of Christ as a whole. Can you imagine what would happen in our church when it comes to the generosity of our church? And I see this relationship between Abram and Melchizedek, that, that way of spearheading what community looks like and what it means to use the resources God has given us to bless one another. And again, if you have not joined a CSD group, join one. If you want to talk to me afterwards about starting one, then talk to me. Let's be a church that values community, guys. And you know what I've noticed when it comes to community? And then I'll stop and we'll finish. We have two types of people in this room and even listening to this right now. You have people who want community and will do whatever it takes to change their schedule to make it happen. And then you have people who complain about community and their lack of it, but they do nothing in their life to see it happen. And I'm here to tell you guys, community doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, but I'm the, I, I, am, I love our community group. I love them and I'm thankful for them. And I hope you guys understand that too. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. Let's move on. Verse 21 through 24, and we'll finish. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. Look what he says. I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. Verse 24, except... Only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who were with me, Aner, a school memory, let them take their portion. So after this victorious battle, the king of Sodom, he's like, I want to reward Abram. Everything you did, man, the least I can do. And Abram, he's recovered what was taken. It was taken by the partnership of these five kings. In his mind, he's like, I'm just taking back what belonged to these people. And he offers Abram a portion of this tremendous amount of, of stuff and plunder that was taken. Yet Abram didn't take it. He wouldn't take it. He refused the spoil because he didn't want anyone to say that, he, that a man made Abram rich. Instead, Abram demanded that all the credit go and success go, all the wealth go to God and God alone. And I think that's another important lesson for us as to when something happens, and I tell you that story of what took place that blessed the Reitmer family, God gets the glory for that because we were just hanging out, you know? God gets the glory for that. And that's the point when stuff like this happens where God prompts you to do something that's going to bless those within the, the body and to even bless those outside of the church that are without Christ, that God gets the credit because it is. It's better. It's so much better to follow God's wisdom so that when success comes your way and you see it, that God gets the glory. And it's evident that it's his work. The ounce and the temptation to say, you know what, I kind of am awesome, is completely eliminated and God gets all the credit. Abram did say, let them take their portion. You know, in his mind, they were entitled to as much as the spoil that was appropriate under the customs of that time. 
Like, don't give it all to me. They work just as hard. But I want you to notice how Abram didn't impose his principles on those, on his new allies. Because, again, that's legalism. Guys, war is inevitable. Spiritual warfare is definitely inevitable. But with God, the odds are always for us. Guys, even though spiritual warfare is inevitable, I'm going to say it again, the odds are for us when we put on the armor of God. And it's also true that like men, like-minded men and women that love Jesus, guys, put them by your side if you haven't yet. Put them by your side. God created you and I to have community. But you, ladies and gentlemen, have to take the initiative you have to take the initiative to see that happen and to see the blessings that come from it. And with that, we end Genesis chapter 14. Let's pray. God, I thank you again for the example of Abram, a man of faith, fickle at first, <sighs> comes to a place where you impart wisdom to him that he's able to rescue his nephew, that you went before him, that the odds were literally impossible, and yet you took the impossibilities of what really man can accomplish and you went before him and you protected him and you did exactly as you said, that you would bless those who would bless him and you would curse those who would curse him. You are a God who makes proclamations, declarations, promises, and they are true and we can trust in that. And I pray for any person in here who is doubting that even for the slightest moment that, you know, maybe you aren't a God that fully is on board and loves us and takes care of us, that you are a good God, that you give good gifts to your kids, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Help us to be grateful again, Lord, to count our victories. Help us again to come to a place where we can, even in the midst of craziness, fall on our knees and say, I don't get it, but I love you, Lord. This is hard, but I love you, Lord. I just pray for us as a church that we would be men and women that are generous with the resources you've given us, not just financially, but with our time, that we would be men and women that give back to you because it's an act of worship. Bring us back to that place again where we can come and say, you are good. We love you and we praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.